Thank you very much. And uh, good afternoon, everybody, and, and welcome to uh, my webinar on designing more effective strategies for developing frontline leaders. You've heard a little bit about my, my background, so I'm not going to go into that any further now. What I'd like to do is start by giving you an overview of, of what to expect in this, in this webinar uh, and then get straight into uh, the, the content, which I know will be very valuable to you. I want to look today at, at five important aspects of this topic of developing frontline leaders. You know, why I believe you should have your focus on the frontline above all other levels of leaders. Some ways to assess your current strategies to see if they are um, in line with the best practice and ways that they could be improved. To pose to you, you know, six simple questions to, to look at the effectiveness of your programs to cut through a lot of the conflicting information that you may have heard out there around putting together effective programs, to look at my four-step process that I recommend to my clients that will give you a real focus to what you're doing, therefore save you time, money and energy, and also talk about five skill areas that I think you need to focus on uh, in the initial stages of developing an effective frontline leader. I want to start by looking a little further at some of my philosophy around the way that I believe we should be developing leaders. And this is because you know, I really want to start a grassroots change to the way we develop our frontline leaders. Too often we, we simply throw them into the role because they seem to be very good technically, uh, they seem to, uh, eager to do the job, uh, and perhaps we don't give enough thought to what's really required uh, for them to, as this, this picture implies, put down roots, want to stay with your organisation and actually grow into healthy leaders who are going to then create healthy teams which is going to impact on the bottom line performance of your organisation. Now I do a lot of reading and research uh, when, when putting together my programs and writing my books and one author who uh, has caught my eye recently uh, with his latest book is Daniel Pink. And he has a new book out called uh, A Whole New Mind. And in here he explores the, uh, the changes that are happening in workplaces and takes us on a journey from the industrial age factory of the past, which as you can see from this picture is very different than, than the workplaces of today, and talks about you know, the, the, the phases that we've been through there from the industrial age through to the, the information age, the knowledge age, and looks at the changing uh, factors in these different eras and, and what is needed from leadership in organisations. He then looks to the future and talks about what he calls the conceptual age, where understanding concepts and being able to work with systems is going to become very important. Now this picture here is of actually of the beautiful Daintree rainforest here in Australia, where I'm coming to you from. Uh, and you know, it's a, a real example of what we mean by an ecosystem, where everything is dependent on everything else in order for the system to work. And I believe that is the same with our organisations, that our frontline leaders are part of this ecosystem along with our team members, our senior leaders, our suppliers, our customers, all working together on a concept of how your business should run. And I believe that we need to uh, have this conceptual idea in mind when we're developing our leaders. I think for too long what we've been doing is operating from that old mindset, that industrial mindset. And what that means is that we've been building armies of managers. Now the Australian Army depicted in this picture is, is a, a very proud tradition as I'm sure um, the military is in, in your countries as well. But the model of the military based manager, which is how many of our organisations have been structured up till now, is no longer working. We are not in the industrial age anymore and yet we are still churning out armies of managers to run our organisations when in fact what we need are communities of leaders like the, the community you see here very symbolically of, of many cultures that, that are working in a garden and, and the way that they think is very different to how those military officers think. And this goes to the heart of the philosophies that I like to use with my clients and at which I'll explore more in a moment. So if we want to move from this army of managers into this community of leaders, 
what we need to do is change the tools that we give them. On the left there you have the, the, the typical um, Swiss army knife, that I'm sure issued to military or, uh, all over the world in different forms. That is the equivalent of the tools we've been giving our frontline leaders in the past. I think instead what we need to do is give them a new set of tools, just like the tools a gardener uses would be quite different than what an army officer uses. Uh, and, and of course this goes to the heart of my philosophy, which is that a great leader is like a great gardener. Now I know I haven't invented this concept. There is a lot of research that's been done on this, including a PhD research paper that was done out of the US um, that uh, talks about you know, philosophies of comparing gardening and leadership, which I in fact quote in one of my books. You know, I'd like to think that I've taken that, that, that concept that's, that's used in bits and pieces by different um, thought leaders and actually turned it into uh, a philosophy by which you can use to not only develop your leaders but also for leaders themselves to, to follow. Now, whether everybody who does my programs you know, thinks of themselves as a workplace gardener, as I call it, or uses some other analogy or metaphor to inform the way they lead, the result is the same. But they're working from a philosophy that governs everything they do, and that, that philosophy is in keeping with the needs of the organisation, the industry they're in, but also the types of people they lead. Now, from my point of view, I believe that organisations of all shapes and sizes have a lot in common with the garden. The organisation is either growing or it's dying. You cannot be stagnant. You cannot be sitting still in any industry. There is new technology, new demands, new legislation in every, in every nation that requires us to keep growing and changing. I also believe that you reap what you sow. And I'm going to explore this idea further along in the webinar, that you need to make sure that, that you are putting in place lots of seeds, that you, that you are putting a lot out there so that you can then sow that later on. Our conditions aren't controllable. It doesn't matter where you are. You are subject to uh, weather patterns, changing consumer demands, uh, the government interventions. Uh, you, you must learn to live with things that you cannot control, just like a gardener can't control the weather. You also need to give it constant attention. Uh, you know, no matter how good you set it up, a garden doesn't operate on its own. It needs your help. And finally, no two days are the same. And I think that's what keeps people interested in gardening, and it's certainly what keeps people interested in leading. You know, that, that they don't have the, every day the same. There are always new challenges, and those challenges can be both positive and negative. But I think that they um, go to what keep leaders on their toes. I think once your every day starts to look the same, that um, you know it's time to perhaps find a new role. Now this goes to the heart of my philosophy, and of course you can learn more about this on my website, and I have a slide share presentation on it as well if you want to go into further detail. But it's based around these five key points. Firstly, I don't believe that you build teams, that I believe that they, they form organically, and you need to find a way to help that happen rather than to, to force them to, to be built like you would a piece of machinery. Uh, working with the nature of people, this, um, I'm a great believer in the book Now Discover Your Strengths um, by um, Buckingham and Clifton. Uh, and I certainly believe that we need to find out what is the nature of, of our leaders that we're trying to develop and work with their strengths rather than focusing on their weaknesses. Just as we know, point number three there, that people all grow at their own pace. So this idea that when you're designing programs, that you need to consider that not everybody will be on the same learning curve. That doesn't necessarily mean they aren't going to be effective. It's just uh, individual. Just as a gardener knows, you can put five plants in the ground and four of them will grow quickly and one will be slower than the rest. It doesn't mean it's a failure. It's just a different nature. We want an environment where everyone can thrive, where we're not just those people who are income earning or degree qualified can do well. I'm a great believer that you need to look at your support staff in organisations and make sure that, that they receive as much attention as anybody else. And finally, the cycle of change. We must embrace it rather than see it as something to be feared. doesn't mean we have to let go of the old ways, that we have to ignore the, the traditions that have served us well, but we do need to look at them in light of the way that um, the community is changing, the world is changing, and make sure that, that uh, 
our organisations are changing with it or we risk becoming uh, irrelevant and from a, an employer's perspective, you know, we're a far more global community now and people are not afraid uh, to leave whatever country they're in and, and transport themselves to the other side of the world if that's where the opportunities are. Now that can work in your favour in reverse of course, that, that people from elsewhere will want to come to your part of the world, but I think we've got to make sure we're all embracing that change if we want to um, have well functioning organisations. So it's time now to get into some of the key points I want to make in this webinar. And I want to start by looking at why I believe we need to focus on developing frontline leaders above all other levels of leader. Uh, uh, now I believe that frontline leaders are the people who get their hands dirty in an organisation. Uh, I, I use that, that phrase you know, um, with, a, with a bit of a smile on my face, you know, the, this idea that they're the people who actually get in and do the frontline work alongside their teams, you know, that they're there to, to help out to work with them rather than the other levels of leadership who've generally long ago moved from, from understanding the day-to-day -day realities of the organisation, which is essential for them to be far more strategic as they need to be in their roles. But um, these are the people who get their hands dirty. And some of the key things we need to know about them, you know, they make up 50% of your leadership team. You know, now this is a, a really important thing to, to realise, particularly um, in light of some research that I've seen um, that, that demonstrates that they often receive about one third of the development money spent on them that senior leaders do. Now, you know, given that they make up half of the leadership structure, it would seem that, that those numbers are not right. You know, that yes, I know that, that programs for higher level leaders often cost more than they do for the people at the front line but I think it's a big mistake to, to not be investing in them. They're certainly responsible for a very large part of your, of your organisation's workforce, up to 80%, sometimes even more. You know, that, and if each of them is working effectively, imagine if 80% of your workforce was 1%, 5% more effective every day, what difference would that make to the bottom line performance of your organisation? Now, whether you're in the business of profit, which I imagine many of you listening in are, but you may well be uh, working for a government organisation, a not-for-profit, who, who are still responsible for using monies wisely even if their goal is not profit. You still want to have a workforce that is, that is functioning at its peak. Now my final point here, and I think this is a really important one too, is that your frontline leaders are your senior leaders of the future. And I believe that just as when you plant something in the ground, if you give it a good start to its life, it is going to reward you later on by having strong growth uh, as it matures. I believe that if you can put the time and effort into developing your frontline leaders effectively to begin with, then less work will be required as they mature into their roles. It's a mistake to think that uh, you can undo their bad habits later on. It is always easier to prevent those bad habits happening in the first place. Uh, as someone with a degree in adult education, I'm well aware that uh, in, the, in most cases, teaching people uh, a new skill, the hardest part is not the new things they need to learn, it's unlearning the old ways. It's actually easier to teach someone who knows nothing about a topic than somebody who thinks they know a lot about it but has actually got misinformation. And I think that's true as well with our, with our senior leaders. Uh, I think if you can get their skills in place when they are young and in their roles, that that will certainly work in your favour. What you want to do is get them off to a good start. So they put down strong roots to create attachment to your organisation, a bit like this, this tree here has put down these strong roots. And even in the face of, of the, the, um, the land being ripped away from it, I imagine in this case um, it's near waterway, that uh, it's still managed to stay in place. And I think if you can get your leaders off to a good start, that they put down roots in your organisation, then they are far more likely to stay. Now I have a background in human resources, so I, so I tend to, to look at um, measuring success and return on investment as employee engagement and, and you know the culture of an organisation. But I'm well aware that many of you listening will be uh, interested in the more financial returns on investment. 
So I, it's some statistics that have come out of the Boston Consulting Group and the World Federation of People Management Associations research has found that effective leadership development programs can create up to 3.5 times revenue growth and also 2.1 times profit margin. So these are some solid statistics. You can certainly look up that research report further for yourself. But they're solid statistics that, that back up you know, my belief in the importance of culture and employee engagement, which I hope will, uh, will assist you uh, to talk to the decision makers in your organisation, uh, to take to your board and your management committee uh, on why there is value in developing this important group of people. So let's keep moving on then. That's looking at why I believe the focus needs to be on the front line. I think though there are some key questions you need to be asking to assess your strategy. I'm assuming that you, know, you have some kind of strategy to begin with. Um, you know, and, and that, that you don't just go out um, doing anything. Just as the gardener who's created these, uh, these beautiful topiary would have had to have had a, a, a strategy in place to get this end result, you also need a strategy when it comes to, um, to developing your leaders. And as was said in my introduction, I, I'm always disappointed when I see organisations who have a very um, ad hoc, unplanned approach to their development. It's a workshop here and a bit of coaching there and attend a, a conference here that might be in a nice exotic location. But if it doesn't create any measurable behavioural change, then it's not really a strategy at all. It is just being seen to spend money on development rather than getting results. And, and as you've heard, you know, one of the things that can happen is it simply frustrates the people you send on these programs. They spend time away from their teams. They have extra work to do when they get back. They even be required to spend time away from their families, all the while thinking, how is this going to help me in my role? Now, when I sit down to talk to potential clients about uh, running one of my programs, I'm always curious to see where they're starting from, for them to start analysing their own strategies. And I do that by looking at 15 issues that they may face. Now I know 15 is a big number, but I know that you can also get this uh, a copy of this webinar later on, the slides, if you don't want to be writing them all down. But these, these 15 issues are, can be divided up into three areas. And the first set is turnover. These are, these are in fact signs that, that perhaps your strategy is not as effective as it should be, depending on what your answers are. So let's have a look at these. The first five are in the category of turnover. So we start by the fact that they have high turnover in their teams, that they have trouble keeping team members. Now, I realise that some industries have a naturally high turnover, but I, I, I think you'll find that many people use that as an excuse when, in fact, it's got nothing to do with the industry or the nature of the work, and it has everything to do with the quality of the leaders that you have. I think many people listening to this webinar will be familiar with the work of the Gallup organisation who tell us that people don't leave organisations, they leave leaders. And so that's often the cause of that, that turnover. Secondly, you have trouble retaining the frontline leaders themselves. Uh, you know, that, that people come through the role uh, and don't stay very long and then move on somewhere else. So that is another sign uh, that you need to look at. You're about to lose many of your frontline leaders potentially to retirement. You know, now, uh, we talk about you know, the demographic changes that are happening with the, uh, the pending retirement of the baby boomer generation. Now, depending on the retirement age in your country, uh, th this will be happening you know, in the next five to ten years. Uh, and, and certainly not everybody who is of that age is at a higher level of the organisation. They may well be at the front line. Uh, you're worried your best ones will leave. So you have some high-performing frontline leaders, but you know your, comp your competitors are uh, contacting them. You know, the likes of LinkedIn nowadays makes it very easy for people to, uh, to be contacted by potential employers. So how is it that you're going to keep those people excited about their roles? And finally, you have some that you wish would leave, but don't. Now, turn not all turnover is unwanted turnover. You know, there's, there, it is a good thing to have fresh talent in this role from time to time. I describe people who've been in their roles for too long who aren't performing uh, at all as the dead wood. 
in an organisation. So that can be just as big an issue uh, as the ones who you're worried are going to leave. So that's turnover. The next set I look at are the skills of your frontline leaders. So are they making costly mistakes? You know, are there things they're doing that, that are, are you know, affecting your bottom line profit? This is a sign that your strategy uh, you know, needs some reassessing. Are, you, are they struggling to handle simple day-to-day -day issues that they should be able to deal with? You know, particularly after they've been in the role for a while, are they coming to more senior leaders with things that, that they can't manage? Are they appearing stressed and unable to cope? You know, now stress is, is the, the largest growing uh, area of workers' compensation claims, certainly in my country and I know in many other countries. You know, it's not physical injury anymore, it's psychological injury we need to worry about. And that can then result in poor decision making, which then loops around and leads us back to costly mistakes. They aren't working as a leadership team, and I'm going to explore this concept a little bit further as I go along, because I think it's a very important thing to focus on. I believe there's a difference between being a leader and having leadership. So I'm going to come back and talk about this one a little later. And finally, they know how to manage, but they don't really understand what it means to lead. Now, of course, at the front line, there needs to be a lot of managing that's going on, but I don't believe that we're giving enough emphasis on showing them how to lead, and it is another point that I will explore in more detail. So our final set relates to your development of them. So getting specifically into development. So firstly, do you have a system for identifying potential leaders? You know, and, and are you able to identify people from when they very first join your organisation and say, is this somebody who may be a leader? Do you have trouble convincing people to take on roles as frontline leaders? Do you have to talk them into it? You know, do you find that you're, they're pushed in there against their will? That's certainly um, a, an issue with the perception of what it means to be a leader. You're training them, but you're not seeing any results. And I'm, again, I'm going to explore this later because, in fact, training may not be the answer to your problem. But if you're, if you're thinking we are putting a lot of time and effort and money into to, to, to getting them up to speed, but it's not working. Uh, are they supported, particularly from their mid-level leaders? Senior leaders often don't have as much to do with your frontline leader, but the mid-level leaders can be a problem. And there is a phenomenon out there uh, that I've heard described by uh, Rolf Habel in, in one of his books, and he calls it the clay layer in an organisation, the layer through which so no light shall pass, meaning that senior leaders have ideas on what, how they want the organisation to run, the frontline leaders agree with them, but it's the people in the middle who aren't supporting these initiatives that are causing you issues with your frontline. And finally, do you have trouble getting them to attend the programs that you put on? Are you not making them attractive enough for your target audience? Now, a lot of your up and coming leaders are what we describe as Gen Ys, and, and they have some very different development needs to other generations. This is a topic I uh, potentially will explore in another webinar later on. But it is important to understand that you know, if people are saying, oh, I don't want to go to that program, you need to re-examine how you're running the program. What is it about it that is putting people off coming along and learning valuable ideas? Maybe it's the format, uh, maybe it's the timing. But these are all things that you need to assess when looking at your current strategy. So these are 15 key areas you need to look at and potentially rate yourself. Which of these are issues for your organisation? Which were issues that you've now solved? And then, of course, figuring out which would be the ones that would give you the greatest impact. If you could fix any one of these 15 issues that you have, uh, which one would you start on? And I think it's important to, to sit down and ask yourself that question because, of course, you can't work on all 15 at once. I doubt that all, you would have trouble with all 15. There might be two, three, five potentially, where you can identify that these are areas we need to work on. So that now brings me to some questions to ensure your programs are more effective. Now, what I want to do is um, get you to keep it simple. And I do that using a model that you've potentially um, seen before. And this is um, 
the model of the five W's and one H as it's sometimes called, or the journalist's tool. Who, what, when, where, why and how. This keeps it really simple. I think if you can ask these questions about your programs, they will give you a very clear indication of ways to improve them. So here's a bit of an explanation of each. So I think with the who, it starts with identifying the type of people that make effective leaders in your organisation. Now that will differ in each industry, in each country, the qualities that are required to be effective. If you can't identify what the qualities your best leaders have, uh, then it's going to be very hard to develop others within, with a similar set of, uh, of skills. You also um, need to look around and see who fits that description amongst people who aren't currently leading. Who are those potentials? And also identify who you have that can help you develop them. Now this is where if you have some mature people in your organisation, perhaps you aren't interested in, in climbing the, the ranks to senior leadership, but you may be able to enlist them as trainers, uh, developers, mentors, coaches for your next level. The what are the knowledge, skills and attitudes that they need to do their job effectively. It's also what programs you already have in place. I'm not suggesting that you get rid of everything you have, but I think you need to take a close examination of what you already have. What do you need to add to those offerings to cover off any areas that are, that are lacking? What do you need to get rid of? So start by examining them. The, the, um, the when. Uh, when do people need to start developing skills? In what order of priority? There are certain skills that come first and others that can wait. There can be a natural progression from one aspect to the next. And that helps you to draw up a program to say, well, you know, for the average person, this is the, uh, the, the, the um, order they need to learn things in. doesn't mean you won't have exceptions, but at least you've got some ideas that you can run with. The where might seem like a minor point, but the, the, the locations need to be appropriate. And here we can talk about things like, should they be in-house? Should they be online? Would they be better off outsourced into a public program? Is a university style course the right place for this development to take place? There are pros and cons of each of these methods in relation to how long they take, what they cost, how readily available they are in your location. But I think the where aspect can, can make a difference. Certain skills cannot be learnt online. Other skills easy, can easily be learnt that way. So I don't think that your strategy should be one or the other, even if your people are in more remote locations. Simply making online learning the solution to everything does not work. Then we get to the why. And in some ways, this is one of the most important. Uh, in fact, you know, I sometimes think, should I put this first? Uh, I'm a great believer in, in, in the work of Simon Sinek. If you haven't come across him before, um, S-I-N-E-K, his, his name is spelt. He has a very good talk on TED.com uh, where he talks about um, start with why. And it's the why um, of delivering that I think is really important. The purpose of your activities. Your participants need to know why they're there. Their, their leaders need to understand the outcomes you're trying to achieve. You know, people won't participate and people won't support your programs if they don't know what's in it for them, the why behind it. Otherwise, your people will, you'll be attracting the wrong people to come on your programs. And yes, you'll fill all the slots available and then discover that they're not the correct people to be there. Uh, and the people who should have been there didn't get the opportunity. So the why is very important. And of course, the how. You know, this gets into the delivery methods. And it could be a workshop, it could be facilitation, coaching, mentoring, self-paced study. It does overlap with the where, I understand that, but even within those where's, the, the how's can vary as well. So there are six questions for you to, uh, to consider when it comes to um, your looking at how effective your programs are. Perhaps use them to review the programs you currently have in place and see uh, if they, you're happy with the answers you get to those six questions. That then brings me on to our step number four. And I look here at a process that will help focus your activities. Now a little activity uh, 
um, or an exercise that, that I used to remember from doing as a child is demonstrates the power of a laser sharp focus and of course it has a gardening angle to it. You know, I don't know if you remember as a child taking a magnifying glass and, and, and looking down into the um, into grass for, for insects. But it's also that idea that if you took a magnifying glass and with the sun in the right angle, you could actually start a small fire. Not that I recommend it, uh, but it was that idea that the laser sharp focus, if you can get that focus right, it can be very powerful. And I think the same is true when it comes to developing leaders. So I, I actually have um, seven areas that I generally look at when it comes to where your program should focus. In fact, I've already discussed one of them with you, and that is focusing on the front line. I think that's where you need to put the most attention, the front line rather than the senior leaders. You may disagree with me, but that, that is my, my philosophy on it. So here are the other six that I want to introduce you to. The first is focusing on what we call the future, not the past. Now, this is, a, um, in fact, an idea that, that I have taken from um, a, a blogger by the name of Dan Rockwell, an, an American who writes um, a blog I follow called Leadership Freak. Very strange name, but he does have some very good ideas. He talks about the root cause of why many leadership development programs are ineffective. And these are, I'll just quote to you some of his words. He believes they're designed to deal with issues that are from the past, that may no longer be issues today, and certainly will be replaced by other priorities in the future. And I think often our development programs are focused on, well, we had something go wrong in the past because our leaders didn't understand this, so we'll make sure our program focuses on, on that area. Yes, we need to make sure that if there are known issues that, that people are, are aware of them and know how to deal with them. But your leaders are going to be operating in a future world. Remember that conceptual age of Daniel Pink from before? They're going, to, they're going to need to know what's going to be happening in five years, 10 years, 20 years from now, and being prepared for that future rather than the things that happened 5, 10 or 20 years ago. So something to think about. How future focused are your programs? The next one is leading rather than managing. Now, if we're talking about developing frontline leaders, your programs need to talk about leading. You know, there are literally thousands and thousands of books. I read somewhere up to 20,000 books and articles written on how to be a more effective leader. The problem is many of them are actually how to be a more effective manager. They don't get the difference between the two terms. You know, now I go into you know, uh, lots of explanation of the difference between these two. I'm not going to have time to do that today. Uh, but I think you need to make sure they really are about leading and not managing. Next, it's leading and leadership. So I made this point earlier, I want to come back and reiterate it. Leading is the skills individuals need to lead their team. I believe leadership is the skills they need to be part of a team of other leaders. You need to all be working together to avoid that, that common term we hear, which is the silo mentality, where I'm just worried about my little patch and not really worried about how it interacts with others. That is not how to run an organisation. The next focused area is concepts as well as skills. And often when we're developing people as frontline leaders, we focus just on skills. This is how to have a performance management conversation. This is how to run a meeting. Uh, we don't give them the concepts that go behind those skills so that they can then make decisions on their own. We tend to save those for more senior levels. I believe you need to be giving them those concepts from very early on. And I certainly focus on them in my programs. Soft skills more than hard skills. Uh, and this comes from um, some research by international consulting firm Ernst & Young. They found that the most high performing leaders place greater emphasis on soft skills than they do the hard skills. So I think we need to make sure that the programs are focusing more on those soft skills, the people skills, rather than technical expertise or a grasp of the financials. Yes, they need them, but they shouldn't be the main focus. And finally, and this one comes from my background in learning and development, is that you need to offer them learning journeys, not learning events. So a journey happens over time, and it often happens with a group of people. So it's not just about the individual learning, it's about them going on a journey with a team of other leaders. 
And this is why I like to design programs that are over an extended period of time, up to nine months, with people meeting regularly, doing projects together, going on this shared journey. It also helps to keep people in the organisation because once they've had this shared experience, they are less likely to leave because they've gotten to know their colleagues along the way. So think about your programs and how much they focus on these areas. What that brings me to then is a four-step process I use with clients to actually put together a program and it looks like this. The first step is planning. Now Gardner uh, puts a, a shovel in the, in the ground until they've done a plan. So this is assessing your current situation to, to determine where you're going to focus, where you're going to get the most impact. What are your future needs? You know, so you avoid that short-term focus. And also, what's a comprehensive list of different initiatives that you could put in place in the next two to five years? They won't all necessarily happen. They won't all necessarily work. I'm a realist here. But I think you need a range of options rather than just one option. And if it fails, then you've had 100% failure. Next, we look at preparing the ground for people to go in. And I think of the ground, the, the, the soil as being like the culture of the organisation. You need to transform it so it's ready to receive new leaders. Make sure that they're viewed in a positive light. You need to create a cohesive leadership team across all levels because that's going to help to support your budding leaders, as I call them. And you need to approach potential leaders to discuss their interest in being a leader and address any concerns they have. You only want willing participants in your program, not people who are there against their will. Next, we go on to nurturing. Once the seeds have been planted, we need to start nurturing. And this is deliver programs that focus on, on the concepts and skills required to lead, as you've already started to, to hear me talk about. It's offering them both training and development options. Okay? So training is, is the, um, you know, the workshop that they sit through. But development, it's the coaching, it's the projects, it's the um, the groups that they're involved in, the teamwork, to, to help them um, get that uh, training put into place. And finally, guidance and support from your existing leaders. This is the mentoring that they need. This is knowing that they have that backup system rather than be told, well, you can go on that workshop, but you won't, I don't, you know, come back and I need you to get your work done, rather than talk to them about well, what did you learn, how can you apply it. The final step is maintain. Every gardener knows that even once their plants are healthy and growing, they need to maintain them. Here, what we need to do is offer development programs at a higher level or perhaps in some niche areas if you're finding that there's certain individuals who need them. Give people access to industry experts and thought leaders and also create a coaching and mentoring culture so that people can um, you know, have that ongoing development and become those coaches and mentors themselves. Now, that brings me to the final point of my webinar, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because, in fact, I, I could spend a whole webinar on this. Five areas I think you need to focus on. And this is actually the, the basis of the Budding Leaders program that, I, that I've developed. And the five things that I think are vital are understanding what their role is as a frontline leader, which includes knowing what, it, what they don't do as frontline leaders. It's giving them the right mindset, now, I call it a leading style as opposed to a leadership style. You've heard my thoughts on that already. Communicating as a leader. And also, how do they keep growing as a leader, including helping them to grow the next batch of um, people who are going to go on to lead further um, in their organisation later on. So have a look at your programs and whether you use exactly the same skill areas, but think about what are the key skills you're giving them. Are they relevant, as we said at the beginning, to being a leader rather than a manager? So as we um, start to get to the end of our time and get into question and answer, I like to uh, end all my programs with a, with a model to help you figure out what action are you going to take next. You may have seen this before, but I give it my own spin. I look at what ideas have I planted for you? What things can you start doing? Now, it might only be one thing in there that you've heard me say that you think, yes, we could add that to our existing programs. The second is the weeding. In other words, what are the things you need to stop doing? 
what are the things that you've realised are not working for you? And just stopping them will make a vast improvement. And finally, the fertilising. What are the things you need to continue doing? What have you realised when well, you're on the right track and perhaps you just need to be more consistent or persistent to get a better result? Now, if you want to learn more about many of the ideas that I've talked about here today, uh, you can download a free um, executive briefing paper available on my website called How to Grow Productive Frontline Leaders, which you can see there is available at letsgrow.com.au. Whilst you're there, you may also be interested in having a look at my latest book, Greenhousing, Nurturing the Next Crop of Leaders. And as you can see from the description there, it covers off some of the areas that we have um, discussed today, but goes into a whole lot more detail uh, of how you can put together a program that's really going to address the needs of those, uh, of those frontline leaders. And that is available as both a printed book or as an e-book. Uh, for you to access. Now you can also, uh, if you're interested in learning more uh, about my ideas on developing frontline leaders, uh, you'll find me on LinkedIn, uh, Facebook, Twitter, SlideShare and also videos on YouTube. So depending on what your preference for social media may be, uh, there's certain to be something there for you. And finally, I can assist organisations of all shapes and sizes uh, in, in all countries. I, uh, I do a lot of work not only here in Australia and New Zealand but also throughout Southeast Asia and the Middle East uh, in, in looking at a, a range of programs with new ones being added on all the time. So there may be something there that is of interest to you and more details are, are certainly available on, uh, on my website. So on that note, uh, I'm going to see how we are going for some questions. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Karen, for a very interesting presentation. Folks, we are open for Q&A. If you have a question, you can either raise your hand or you could equally put the questions in the question box. I will be happy to read them over on your behalf. I see there was a hand raised already. So, uh, okay, let me go to first uh, uh, Mr. Musa Alamir. Brother Musa, can you hear us? Could you please ask the question and introduce yourself? Yes, uh, thank you uh, for Mr. Karim for this uh, valuable session. Uh, my question, uh, could uh, Mr. Karim uh, give us uh, a brief, short brief about the uh, differences between uh, leader and manager? Of course. Uh, That's a, thank you very much for, for your question. You know, I, this is uh, one for me that goes to, to the heart of, of understanding how to put together the right kind of programs. Now, in putting together my, my last book on greenhousing, I've, I've done some research here and, you know, there, there are many, many definitions and the difference between these two terms. You know, um, but the one that I like to come up with, and this is putting my workplace gardening spin on it there, is that, that to me managing is, is that idea of, of helping people, you know, survive in their role. You know, that they've got, they understand that these are my tasks that I've got to do. They're, get, they're getting by, but they're not doing brilliantly. Uh, whereas leading, to me, is helping people reach their full potential. It is showing them the, the potential that they have within themselves and you being able to bring that out, rather than the person just doing a set of tasks and completing those. It's actually helping people to, to thrive at work, to achieve great things. And I think that that's what leaders are able to do. And certainly at the front line, we need people who have a combination of both, who are able to get, manage the tasks, but are also able to inspire their team as leaders to be the best of themselves that they, that they can be. So I hope that that helps to um, give you my answer on the question. Yeah, can we say that um, uh, each leader can be manager, but not every manager can be a leader? Yes, very true, very true indeed. And I think that um, we, we need to stop calling people a leader if they really aren't a leader. Uh, often companies use the term team leader. When well, really they're not, they are the team manager. And it's, it's unfair to call them leader if you then don't allow them to lead and don't give them any skills to lead. Uh, yeah, thank you. 
You're welcome. Well, thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you very much, Brother Musa. Let me move to another caller. We have uh, Brother Ijaz Ahmed Khan. Sir, if you can hear me, could you please introduce yourself and ask a question? Um, I'm Dr. Ijaz Ahmed. Uh, I'm serving as uh, head of the program in healthcare administration and I'm also a director of quality and development affairs in Bataji Medical College, Jaddam. Uh, my question is uh, regarding uh, the, the uh, basically the concept of leadership and, ma um, ma and management. Uh, are leaders born or they are created? Ah, what a very good question. Very good question. Um, many people, you know, are of the belief that, that leaders are born, and I will agree that some people, even from a very early age, can demonstrate the qualities of being a leader. But I am very much of, of the belief that anybody can become a leader if they have the desire to do so. Um, you know, it, it, it's like in many pursuits in life that that having a natural advantage can help you. Uh, it's not unlike um, a person in a particular sport. Now, my country, we're very big on, on sport, and, and often if somebody is said to have the, the right type of physical characteristics to succeed in a particular sport, we say they are natural. But there are many, many examples of people who were not born with that natural advantage and yet go on to be highly successful at their chosen sport. So for me, uh, I think that it's more about desire than it is about natural talent. I have also seen people who have natural talent, but if that talent is not uh, nurtured, it's not given the right environment, uh, or as I would say, it's like a seed. If it's not germinated, it's never going to go, up, go on to grow into a tree. That if people aren't given that right environment, that their natural talent can go untapped. And so you could have, sitting in your organisation right now, somebody who is a natural leader, but because they are not showing that talent in a way that, that is obvious to you, or they perhaps don't want to use that skill. Just because you have a skill does not mean you want to use it. And I've met many a person who is a natural leader, but for whatever reason chooses not to take on that role in an organisation. So I, I am a great believer that, that, uh, le that leadership skill can be developed in people, but not against their will. They must want to do it. If someone comes to you and says, I know I'm not naturally a leader, but I desire to be one, they can acquire the skills to do it. Okay, this means, question. Okay, this means that uh, by creating a culture or an environment for leadership doesn't mean that the manager can become a leader? Not necessarily. Some people are happy to stay managers. They're very mm -hmm. good at it, they enjoy it, it um, suits their particular skill set, and we need mm -hmm. managers. But we also need people who can lead, and I think we need to know the difference between the two, and not force people to try to pretend to be leaders when it's, when it's something that they're not interested in doing. And I think this is, this is what happens when we, put the, we choose people to be leaders for the wrong reasons. And, you know, and I, I talk about many different reasons that we get it wrong, but it's often we take the technician, somebody who's very good at the technical work, perhaps in your case it's somebody who is, has very good medical skills, and then we say, well, we want you to be the leader of others. It doesn't necessarily equate to success. It may well be that somebody whose medical skills are at good but not outstanding would go on to be a far better leader of other doctors and nurses than somebody who has the highest technical capability. Okay, this leads this leads to another question that yes. you talked about the skills. Yes. In your lecture, but you didn't talk about the competencies. So, do you mean about the competencies that are necessary for these type of uh, leadership? Look, I would uh, you know, when I, I use the, the term skills, you, you could also insert the word competencies there. I think uh, it depends on, on what um, industry you operate from as to what you call them. Um, I think that those skills or competencies vary from industry to industry. I don't think that there is one set that works for everybody in every situation. Um, I think that there 
that that is where you overlap between also the concepts, understanding the concepts of what it means to lead as well as having these specific skills to do it. Thank you very much. Thank you so nice. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Khan, for the questions. Uh, let me move to another caller. We have uh, Dr. Mohammed Rashad. Dr. Mohammed, you have a question. Could you please introduce yourself and ask a question? Yeah, I'm uh, Dr. Mohammed Rashad. I'm the assistant professor at Salman bin Abdul Aziz University in Al Khurj. And uh, uh, hi, Karen. Thank you very much for a very fantastic presentation. I like your uh, style of uh, you comparing gardening with the, of tutoring uh, frontline managers. And uh, my question is uh, in the slide where you mentioned about the workplace gardening philosophy. You talked about garden, organic, the nature of people, pace, environment. And I thought of, like, uh, is it possible we can add one more that is resources? We can call this them as like, like the four S, uh, that is the seed, the soil, the supplies, and the suppliers, you know, that uh, the inputs are, have to be important. So what's your, what is your comment on that? Oh, I, I, I like very much that you've enjoyed my, my, um, my analogy that I use and that, that I've already got you thinking about other places of ways that you could, uh, you could make use of it. Uh, yeah. And, and the, the challenge with putting together a philosophy is that um, I believe for it to be memorable it needs to be short, which is why I've kept it to, to five points. But You're certainly right. I, I explore in, in, in some of the other material that I have in going into further detail on each of those points. And certainly, mm -hmm. yes, you, the, the soil for me is, is very, very important. The culture of the organisation that you put right. people into uh, cannot be um, uh, you know, ignored um, mm -hmm. because you can take a fantastic uh, you know, person and put them in the wrong culture and they just fail. So right. you know, I like your, your use of the four S's. Um, yeah. <laughs> And I may, I may have to ask your permission to, to, to include it ne in my next webinar. Yeah, by all means you can. You have all freedom. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, Thank yeah, you yeah. Very much. And, and uh, my second uh, thought process is like uh, uh, when you're talking about the frontline leaders, is it uh, like some kind of a niche you're uh, uh, focusing on or uh, like uh, the leadership as a macro level? Is it because I'm a, a professor so for, for teaching my students, so you think like frontline can be another chapter in a altogether exclusive for in human resource um, uh, program or something like that. Is it a new thought process coming up now? Well, look, I think that you know, we, for too long we have we have talked about whether you use you know, if you're talking about the management side or the leadership side, and we, we've thought of it as one lar you know, one large group of people. But in mm -hmm. fact, what's required at at the if you Think of say the three different levels in an organisation. So the front line. So in other words, the people who who are in charge of the people doing the work. Right. Mm -hmm. Quite different than the mid level and the senior level. And yet mm -hmm. we we tend to talk of them about them all at the same time, imagining they are the same people. Mm -hmm. And yet they, they go through those various um, changes. I know that there is a um, uh, one of the the books that that I've read on this. Uh, the leadership pipeline. They talk about six or seven different, what they I think they call them turns or right. stage, you know. And, and at, at each one of those stages, people mm -hmm. acquire different skills. Uh, mm -hmm. And so I very much agree that um, you know understanding the the challenges of leading at the front line of taking on that first level position are very different than you know, leading a multi-million dollar organisation and doing strategic planning and mm -hmm. workforce management. It's very different than I have a team of five people who, who literally get their hands dirty every day digging holes in the ground or, right. or transporting goods or something. It's mm -hmm. a whole different scenario. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks, Ali, for giving the opportunity. Thank you very much, Dr. Mohammed, for asking the question. and. Uh, let me move to a question box. We have a question from Susanna Toma. The question is, personally, I found a balanced leadership style, including some of the aspects of military as discipline, are very important if we were to develop a team to reach full potential. What are your thoughts on that? Ah, yes. Well, the, the military in, in all countries has been um, responsible for a lot of our 
uh, development programs and our ways of thinking about how to lead organisations. And, and certainly um, I've had some personal dealings with them in, this, in my country and also in Asia uh, and, and have great respect for some of the models that they've put in place. But what I find interesting now in, in 2014 is in researching my last book, I actually made contact with, um, as it turned out, an American um, military officer who is of the belief himself that um, the military needs to uh, start producing leaders who think more like gardeners. He'd actually written a research paper on this point that they've got to humanise that experience. Yes, it's a dangerous environment and, and of course protocols need to be followed. You need to know that if you give an order that your troops will carry out that order or people will literally die. A uh, very serious environment. The problem we have is that most of the organisations who take on board a very militaristic approach to developing their leaders do not operate in such life and death environments. And so some of the, the methodologies that are employed in the military do not work in, in a retail store or, or, or you know, in, in some other environment. So I think it's, it, it's interesting that, that, yes, even the military are starting to rethink uh, to become more humanistic in their ways. Some countries are slower than others. Uh, but I think if we can retain the best parts of what they've taught us, uh, but then update them to reflect the changing nature of organisations. Uh, I know here in Australia that, that we're having to change the way we try to recruit people to the military because young people certainly don't want to sign away five or ten years of their life. Uh, so everything is changing, including the way the um, modern military is approaching how it leads its troops. And Suzanne has also commented, thank you, she agrees, and really appreciate your thoughts. Uh, we had another question, let me try to unmute, Brother Abdul Rahman Fati. Brother Abdul Rahman, can you hear us? Can you introduce and please ask a question? Yeah, thank you. First of all, uh, my name is Abdul Rahman Fati. I'm from Egypt, I'm first at work, the end of my role of science in the program policy. And my problem is that uh, it's, it's not general, it's personally something. Um, it's um, the first time to speak to um, my coach. So uh, I started my career last in, in the first of this month. But um, I will be uh, uh, being a leader, not a member. So I have this problem I can't handle with this. Please, Mr. Kain, can you hear me? Okay. Well, would I understand? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm ha having a Karen, did you understand the question? I think there was a noise in the background. Yes, there was. There was quite a bit of noise. Can can you can you help with that, um, Ali? To, to let me mute, brother, and let me try to repeat because yeah, if you do you want me to repeat, he has posted the question in the box as well. Yes, that would be very helpful. Thank you. But. I think the clarity would be required, but I think we can take it. He mentioned I was a class leader for two years and the president of the chapter of the university and a team leader in various competitions. But when he started the career, he could not become a leader and it is becoming difficult for him to handle this problem of not reaching towards the leadership stage. Ah, right, right. Yes, um, and if that is, I don't know whether it's a lack of, of opportunity within his organisation. I am a great believer that if you want to develop in a particular area that, that you need to take positive action of your own to, to demonstrate your commitment. Now for some people that can be through volunteer work in organisations outside of their workplace. There are always community groups out there who are looking for people who are willing to to assist, and this may be a place, in fact, to develop those skills, to, to um, demonstrate the, the willingness to learn, to, to get some sort of um, uh, reference that can then be used with your employer to, to demonstrate that uh, you have what it takes. Um, whilst, you know, usually when I'm working with organisations, my goal is there, I'm employed by the company. I do also do individual coaching from time to time and, and sometimes I have to advise people that if they are finding that there are too many barriers in place in their organisation, 
that they need to look at their, at their options of actually moving to another organisation that does allow them to um, fulfil their, um, uh, their desires, that, you know, their potential. Uh, but obviously we have to um, measure that against the feedback they might be receiving, you know, to say, well, this is the areas where you need to develop further and this is why we haven't promoted you to, to be in that position. So I would say, you know, certainly look where is outside your workplace that you could perhaps develop these skills and demonstrate your readiness to use that as evidence for um, potentially your, your current employer. I, I, I hope I have um, understood that question properly and, and answered it effectively. Uh, we have another one, a short one, um, uh, rather a last one, from Brother Khalid Feroz Chana, who's mentioned it's a very nice presentation, but could you tell us how should one motivate the top management to plan these leadership development programs? Oh, what a very good question, yes. And I think this is where you need to understand what motivates your top management. You know, this is where I mentioned earlier in my webinar about um, the different measures people can have of, of what success means. Now, for me, coming from a human resources background, I am very interested in creating positive cultures to have good employee engagement you know, in an organisation. That is not necessarily the uh, most important. It helps them to, to grow more uh, uh, productive frontline leaders. And I really want to thank you on behalf of Mile for your time and for giving this very intriguing presentation. And thank you to all of those who participated in and for raising the questions and making it interactive experience for all of us. We are recording this webinar, which will be uploaded on Mile Community, which is community.mile.org. So please stay tuned to our online community. Uh, with that note, I would like to end this webinar. Uh, so let's, you all have a good day, good evening, good night, wherever you're calling from. Till then, thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.